Welcome to Rebel Without Applause, where we explore the intersection of sports, entertainment, and culture. I'm your host, Maurice Bob, and today we have a very special guest on the line. He is a professional basketball player, currently playing overseas for Hopewell, Jerusalem, of the Israeli Premier League. Don't Ladies and gentlemen, say that right. <laughs> please give a warm welcome to Tashawn Thomas. How you doing, bro? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, How about doing a pronunciation? <laughs> it was good. It was good. Quick, quick learning. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I want to make sure I get it right, man. Um, you know. Uh, so as we dive before we dive into things, you know, how are you holding up, and uh, how have you been holding up as far as you know during these uh, turbulent times with the pandemic? And uh, you know, it was it's tough. You know, I know everybody's going having their problems, but uh, you know, uh, fortunately for me, I was able to stay home. You know. For a lot of know a lot of basketball players were forced to like kind of go back to work. I was able to stay back and you know spend some time with my family, some time I never got to spend. You know, I was able I was home for like five, six months. You know, you only get two months home at a time. So that was big for me. So with that, I'm kind of, you know, on a good side with it, but at the same time, you know, I'm still missing home right now. It's, it's crazy right now, you know, just knowing what's going on back home. Yeah, that's understandable. Um mm -hmm. very understandable. How how do you feel like they're treating you know the pandemic there as opposed to here oh uh, it's way different uh over here they they're listening <laughs> like uh, they'll, <laughs> they'll shut something down i mean for the most part you know it's kind of it's in a way it's kind of this it's kind of like it's more people listening in areas back home uh like here i know a lot of their religious people don't really care too much what the government is saying so you know they're wearing masks going wherever they want but like the malls had just back opened maybe for like after like a month. They had locked down for like a month, maybe a month and a half. So maybe two days ago, everything started opening up again. So I'm kind of getting back to normal, just, you know, seeing people again. But I know back home, everything's been open. So it's different. Like, you know, I know it's just a different lifestyle right now for everybody. Yeah, it's crazy. It's 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 either you're all in or all out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. It seems like there's and more you, all out here in Texas. <laughs> yeah, and you got to kind of, it seems like right now, it seems like everybody has to just kind of be ready. You know what I'm saying? got to be like on your feet. You got to be ready, you know what I'm saying? Ready for change and like can't just be, you know, sitting in the same spot for too long. Exactly. Cool, man. Well, hey, um, so, you know, I like to start things off with a, um, you know, interesting question. Um, you know, as you know, the uh, title of the podcast is called Rebel Without Applause. And, uh, you know, I like to start, start every guest off with this question. Uh, okay. What to date has been your most rebellious moment? Hmm. Hmm. I was. Uh, that's a good question, man. That's 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 a good question to start it <laughs> off with. My, but my most rebellious moment was, uh, I think, and it's big for me because I know I'm a person, you know, I love basketball. Everybody knows I play basketball, but, you know, I'm big with family, too. And uh, one, uh, a lot of people are going to probably give me heat for this, but uh, senior year, college at OU, um, I have a chance to go to the Final Four and play in the, um, like, the senior, you know, they have like a, like a senior all-star game, like, dunk contest thing. Mm -hmm. Had a chance to be there. And we lost to Michigan State. I didn't feel like we were supposed to lose. I ain't want nothing to do with the tournament. Didn't want nothing to do with nothing else with the tournament. So my coach calls me, tells me he's pulling a lot of strings to get me to this this all star game. But I'm really just trying to go see my girlfriend. <laughs> like I'm really <laughs> just trying to go see my girlfriend because I know that the draft process, you know, all that working out is about to kick in. I have a little chance, like a little weekend. So I'm like, let me do this. But coach tears me apart when he finds out that I didn't want to go. And, like, I just feel like that was big because, like, I know a lot of other guys that would probably easily go to that, you know, that Final Four. But I was just – I was over. I knew that, that – I knew I had a lot of basketball ahead of me and I wasn't really trying to focus on college anymore. Oh, so, uh, that's, that's like definitely I, understandable. But at the same time, <laughs> yeah. I can see why it would, like, you know, uh, make some people mad like your coach. Exactly. Like, what, <laughs> what you mean you didn't go to that for your girl, bro? Like, she can wait. Like, nah, bro, like – I was in a whole different mental state. That senior year was 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 a tough year. So, uh, yeah, I can I can imagine. Um, so you know, let's uh, talk a little bit about your journey and you know go back a little bit. Um, okay. You know, when did you first you know 
I guess, pick up a basketball or find out that you like basketball? And when did you feel like you, you know, want to go ahead and pursue things in basketball? I started playing basketball probably like maybe third grade, like with my mom and dad, like around the house, dribbling around the house. But I didn't really get serious with basketball until maybe freshman year of high school. I didn't play. I like, I like, I went to Virginia every summer. I didn't play AAU basketball like guys all the time until mm -hmm. senior year. So, I mean, until uh, so, uh, freshman year of high school. So, I was going to Virginia, chilling with my family. I was playing basketball still, just wasn't AAU basketball. So, I was just going, hanging with them all the time. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't, and then I hit a growth spurt at the end of my freshman year, and that kind of like sparked, you know, some attention towards me. I took, you know what I'm saying? I started starting. I was like a bench player the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, after that, I started getting some some notice, and I was like, okay, this is like I like this. Football is not it for me. My dad wanted me to play football all the time. I got too tall for that. Two people taking out my legs all the time. I was like, yeah, basketball is it for me. So I would say freshman year of high school is when I realized like basketball was it for me. It's funny how life kind of makes your decision for you. Definitely. <laughs> it might have been <laughs> up in the air, like, oh, which one should I choose? But then you just you know you hit that growth spurt. I'm like, oh, basketball it is. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's crazy because, you know, in living in Texas, football is huge. So, uh, like, I remember my sophomore year of high school, the, court, the coach came to me and was like, can you throw a football? And I was like, hey, you want me to play quarterback? Like, I ain't never played quarterback in my life. I know I wasn't about to be on varsity, so I was just like, I had a best friend going to Kansas, you know, starting quarterback on the varsity. So I'm, like, I'm not about to play over him, so. Let's go have fun with it. Worst decision I made in my life. That's the <laughs> that was a bad decision. Very bad. <laughs> I was I was not ready for that. That's a that's a different that's a different playing field right there. That quarterback position is it's different. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot so, that goes into it because you gotta know how to read defenses, you gotta know all the plays, you gotta know all the trick plays, you gotta just exactly. so many I was a receiver before. So that receiver position is just knowing your routes, knowing who to block. That's it. So, <laughs> transferring <laughs> over, was, yeah, transferring over was different. So, after that sophomore year, I was like, "Yeah, basketball is it for me." <laughs> <laughs> well, I like, well, like you made the right decision, though. So, you know, definitely, you know, most definitely, no regrets. <laughs> so, you uh, you went to uh, high school in Colleen, correct? Yeah. So, were you a military brat, or how'd you guys find yourself in Colleen? Um, I wasn't, but my dad was, and my his my my grandparents kind of sticked around Colleen. So, you know, uh, my dad entered the military, ended up coming back. I think he entered like what, but my grandma found out she was sick, so we kind of wanted to be close to home before you know passed. They didn't really tell us anything. We didn't know what was going on, but you know, this was there to spend those past couple years with her before she passed. So that was a big reason why we moved back and just kind of stayed thereafter. Okay. Uh, was that kind of uh, formative as far as cause I can imagine Colleen being, so, you know, it's a military town. So a lot of like discipline and things like that. Uh, yeah, I think it shows up in me a lot. You know, a lot of my dad's side, of, well, both my mom and my dad's side of the family, like raised me to like, you know, the no, sir. Yes, sir. But I feel like that's being in the South in general. But with them, it was what you say? Like, yeah, I was like, like what you say? Oh, my, yes, sir. I said, you know, say it was like they always corrected you. So. I feel like that kind of carried over with sports. You know, I'm kind of always trying to be the guy to try to lead the team to kind of do the right thing in the most most of the time. So I, f I definitely feel like that discipline kicked in and, you know, I try to carry it over to my professional lifestyle. Perfect. So, uh, you know, like you said, things change for you when you hit that growth spurt. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your high school career and how did that go as far as, you know, playing and advancing and, you know, getting national recognition? Uh, it was, it was why it was different than I would say most guys, you know, that playing professional, you know, I would say it was a lot different because I can't, like I said, I came here freshman year, not really even knowing if I really wanted to play basketball. So hit that growth spurt, played like a, I think I played with like a mid, you know, AAU team, a team out of Austin, Texas Ambassadors, shout out to them. Uh, <laughs> I played with them my freshman year and then things didn't really work out. I ended up playing with the a team out of Colleen, my Showtime team was like guys from my high school. So that was fun because I got to, you know, be with my boys. And then new year is like from that sophomore year into my junior year, like nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew who Tayshawn was. Nobody knew anything. 
because uh, at my school, Corey Jefferson was like the big name on campus, like my, okay. my sophomore year. He graduated, went to Baylor. So coming in my junior year, they was like, who's going to be the new big guy? Colleen, nobody knows. So I had a burst out year that year, like just went, had a huge year. And like everybody kind of put my name on the map. And that year got me to play with the Houston Hoops. And that was like my only year to play with like a big AU circuit. So I knew I had to do well. And luckily, I got a scholarship out of that. So, my my a my a, my college, my high school to college at Stardom was kind of late, but it came in when it needed to. So, it worked out. Cool. So, you, you wound up going to U of H. Were there any other colleges that you were considering that, that you almost went to? Uh, there was two. I was uh, there was another one that was really Temple. I was really thinking about going to Temple. I have a lot of family on the East Coast that like. You know, like I said, I was going to Virginia all the time. I was only like two hours from where my family stayed. So I was kind of like trying to be in with that. And then Colorado was another school, mainly because uh, Andre Roberson, you know, from uh, used to play with OKC. I don't know if he's still with OKC or not, but uh, he uh, was there. And my dad and myself saw like a lot of similarities in us, you know, like could do a lot of different everything and things like that. But it just never, never happened. And I just fell in love with Houston because it was so close to home. I played with the Houston Hoops, so I knew the city a little bit, so it just worked out. So, you know, what was it like, you know, going to U of H? Obviously, U of H has that rich history that goes all the way back to Paz Lama Jama, um, mm -hmm. but it's been trying to kind of regain its footing in the modern era. Like, what was it like uh, when you got there and, and trying to st help establish that uh, new identity? It was definitely tough, you know, because uh, like, man, that Fox Sam Magema, you kind of get tired of hearing about it, you know, like uh, they kind of stole the show a little bit, you know, but, uh, with us not being too good of a team at the time while I was there and them being who they were, the legends they are, you know, they would be in the pregame warmups, like the video, they'd be in that, have them incorporated with us. And I'm just like, man, they like that's so long ago. Like, you know, <laughs> it, was just, it was hard. They always bring them around, always bring it up. So. But the one thing I do feel good about is that, they, like you said, Houston's comment, they're, they're back at the top now, man. They, uh, they're doing real good. I'm really happy to see where they're at, you know, and to just be a part of that and a part of that climb to, you know, say I was there before they were good, you know, before the, the, new, the new era came with Samson and everything. It's just, a, it's just good, you know. I just love to see that because, you know, I still got love for Houston all day. So, so like, you transferred, your, like, uh, for your senior year at OU, right? Yeah, uh, that's that seems kind of odd or a different kind of move. What what prompted that move, and you know what was that transition like? So every year I was at Houston, a coach that I got like probably like the, you know I don't, every player kind of gets close to like you know close to one coach, and every year I was there, that coach that year left. My freshman year, we had a coach go to SMU in the same conference, so that hit big. <laughs> Sophomore year, the next coach I got close to went to uh, Iowa State. So then junior year, the head coach leaves. So I'm like, man, none of the coaches from when I come in is here. You know, I didn't put the work in. I feel as if like I have a chance to make the tournament. You know, I should I should take this chance. And Samson was coming in. I had no disrespect to him. I just told them, hey, I want y'all guys to recruit me. I want to give y'all the same chance, you know, that all these other schools deserve. Now that you'd like, you would be my new coach. And I hit the market and it was just really, I, if I, if I would have, if if Houston would have been a little bit more promising at that time, I probably would have stayed. But I just didn't feel like they could have turned the thing around in that one year. You know, it was I didn't see it happen. You know, not a lot of people do it. So I was like, hey, for my senior, year, I want to go and try to make the tournament. So Oklahoma was. Wow. OK, so um, how did that work Did they, You know, once you hit the market, they, they you know came full speed after you or. Uh, no, nah, that was that that was actually crazy too. Like <laughs> that felt like I was in high school again, kind of like that crazy, you know, rise and stardom because it was like I haven't heard from colleges calling me since you know, senior year of high school. So now I'm back on the market. I got coaches, legendary coaches like you know Bill Self called. That was like probably the craziest call I got. Like him, him himself calling. I was like, whoa, this is different. Like I'm used to just hearing coaches like you know I have to kind of search up, not legendary <laughs> coaches like this. Yeah. You know? different so so when it was like coaches like you know i think kansas called arizona had called miami oregon so like those was probably like the top ones but a lot of the schools were kind of like expecting me to try to sit out 
you know, that year because, you know, you have to sit out most of the time when you transfer. But I didn't feel like, I mean, my we all felt like we had a good case of getting me, you know, to play because I, I wasn't in trouble. I didn't do anything wrong. You know, I was on I was on time to graduate and, you know, it would kind of be a waste of time to to uh, have me sit out that year. So we, we actually fought it and they accepted it. So I got cleared literally the day before the like first game of the season. I didn't play no ex- exhibition games, no scrimmage, nothing. Just the day before, like before. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, you were in a position, I think, too, that was advantageous because, like you said, your head coach left. And that's a mm-hmm. big deal, I think, as far as the rules are concerned. Like, hey, you, you came here to play with a certain coach and he leaves. You ought to be able to leave, too, or, you know, have that option. So Yeah, like, definitely. So that's something we push for. That's, that, that's something we push for because it was – I mean, I just – like the people – we had to – so they denied my appeal at first, you know, to me trying to get the, the – uh, my release they denied it so we had to go to appeal so in the appeal it felt so weird because i'm talking to you know people that i see all the time that love me you know hey tayshawn good game yesterday now they're like feel like we're on a a different team so like i'm like this all comes from like you know a coach getting either fired or you know resigning whatever you want to call it whatever happens and I was like, this is all from like one person making a different, like, you know, making that decision. Like, this is crazy. I had nothing to do with it. I, like, I didn't tell him to leave. I wanted him to stay. You know, I wanted everything to be the same. So it was it was definitely a hard decision to even leave. So what was that um, that one year in Oklahoma like for you? Um, you know, talk about how you got acclimated and, you know, did you guys even make the tournament? Oh, yeah, we made the tournament. And that was <laughs> that was huge. Uh but that year at Oklahoma was big for me. You know, I feel like it opened my eyes. Uh, like being the being the guy at Houston, like was good and all, but you know, we weren't we weren't really a winning team. So that's I mean, for me, that kind of didn't really matter. You know what I'm saying? I never really was too happy about the fact that I was the best player on the team that finished like, you know, at the bottom of the conference. So it just wasn't satisfying to me. So when I went to Oklahoma, start seeing like, you know, more guys that really cared about the game, getting extra shots up after practice, you know, like just seeing a whole group of guys that are like bought into winning. It was different. You know, I was like, wow, like I got somebody else holding me accountable, making sure I'm getting in the gym, you know? So it was, it was, it was, it was different, you know, being around those guys was, it was, it was, it, was, it helped me because like being around Buddy Hill, real gym rat, never seen anything like it, man. That seeing, so, like seeing somebody that has that much success at that time, to still want to work, like it just, I'm like, wow, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you already good, bro. You go sit down, but he's the first yeah. person, last person out. All he needs is bohemian music and he good. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I, I definitely, but uh, yeah, we made the tournament, ended up losing to uh, Michigan State in the Sweet 16. So I got to, you know, taste the tournament and it was, it was fun, you know? So I'm glad, I, you know, I don't regret anything. So do you think, uh, cause you know, you went undrafted in 2015. Do you think switching schools hurt that or helped it or didn't matter? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think about that a lot. And I feel like I've kind of came to the conclusion. I don't think it really hurt me too much. Uh, you know, I feel like the NBA, it, I don't know. I feel like if, if I would have stayed and probably would have put up the same numbers, it would have been like, I probably, it would probably have been the same thing. Like he was at a team that didn't win. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it would have been, he put up these numbers at a school that couldn't get any wins. So rather than he was the third, fourth guy on a team that went to the Sweet 16, it's like, you know, it's like you really can't, I don't know, I really don't, you can't really trade those options too often. You, know, so you can't know what, which one you want to take. So I don't, like I said, I don't really regret leaving. I don't think it hurt me at all either. Those are all, that's, that's always one of those unknowable. Uh, yeah, it's like kind of tough. But yeah, like kind of tough, and like 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 being like during the quarantine, I feel like a lot of people kind of you know let their mind go a lot. So that was like definitely one thing that you know I went back and meditated on and thought about a lot. Like a lot of life decisions I made that kind of changed my career. So yeah. So you know, talk to me about you know going undrafted. Was that one of those things where it made you? It was forced you to reconsider like. How you wanted to approach things? Did you still want to go pro? Did you think you could? Like, what were your thoughts after that? Uh, I kind of, I kind of had the mindset I was going to go overseas already. Okay. Uh, so 
it was just with with how everything was going you know i kind of seen the politics in it from like jump street like from like what you said like when i was at houston name was high on the draft boards i left still was doing well with better players on my team you know less shots whatever and my name dropped so it was like I ain't really, I just was peeping things early, you know, uh, kind of seeing how they were having, you know, workouts for single like guys by themselves, lottery picks not really working out with the guys. I'm like, hold on, what? You know what I'm saying? Like he still, I played against him all season and he's over there working out by himself and I'm over here banging with the guys. Then I just, I could just see it. You know what I'm saying? I just sensed it that it wasn't me, but you know, I didn't really, you know what I'm saying? I was really more just on trying to be pro, like making some money, you know, that was big for me. My family didn't really have a lot coming up. So that was really, I was just looking forward to that opportunity to just trying to be able to, you know, provide and say I've done something, you know, and got out the country. So that's, that was something big. So uh, walk me through the process because, you know, a lot of us, you know, normal sports fans, we know things about NBA. We understand a little bit about that, but it's, it's, it's an undiscussed, undiscussed topic about playing overseas and how that Most comes definitely. about. Do they have special agents that only find overseas opportunities? Like, like how did it even present itself to where you uh, had your first job overseas? I would say, all right, so it depends. It depends. So, like, a guy, you know, like myself that, you know, went to a higher main school, was kind of known, still made it to the combine, you know, still was, like, kind of close at making it to the league. My agent was like a guy that has, you know, guys overseas and, you know, guys in the league. Like he just has both to where there's some agents that have that only try to get guys that are only going to be in the league. And then there's some agents that are literally be hanging around these, you know, these combines knowing, look, looking for guys that they don't like that they know aren't going to make the league. And like, I'm going to sign you since you're overseas. Okay. So, you know, it's different. But the thing I feel like, uh, one good decision I made about my agent was uh, sending to my pops, you know, my like uh, kind of during the draft process, like I said before, I was kind of trying to let my mind go. And I have a real good rel uh, relationship with my pops. So I kind of was sending all the agents to him and was like, hey, dad, get a feel on this guy. You know, ask him some questions. When I get to this point, I want you to have your top five. I'm going to talk to him and I'll pick off that, you know, see if I see how everything went. So. That's kind of how I went into it. My dad lined them up. I had, you know, a couple of good agents. Uh, I went with uh, Adam Pensack from the Pensack uh, Sports Agency. Great agency, you know, have been with them since I've been out. So no problems in there. They've been handling everything for me. But uh, to be real with you, the craziest thing about sign, like going overseas, I feel like is like hearing the team you're going to play for. <laughs> like when you first, you know, like when you first get that contract and you like hear the city, or the team name and you like don't know how to pronounce it you know, or where is this at like how far is this from like when i went to germany my first year promise you nobody that's watching this video is going to know this name weissenfels germany i was this and spelled all type of crazy but i'm like you know where how close is that is that close to berlin is that close to frankfurt like where is that i don't know where that's at the team name was all crazy so it was this crazy you know what I'm, I'm like where am i about to go play basketball like i don't i don't know and that's like and after that it's everything else like getting to the country for the first time having your first practice realizing like you the only like you're only like you and maybe four other americans that's on the team that can speak english and y'all not even from the same place y'all might not even like each other so it's different like you know it's just a lot of a lot of adjusting like i can tell you my first time getting like overseas like settled into the house and realizing there was no AC in my house, I like almost went crazy, almost lost it. Like didn't think I could finish the season. Like <laughs> caught my girl, like, hey, I don't know how long I can stay over here. Like the only AC I can find is in my car. Like wow. even the grocery stores don't even have AC sometimes. So I was, I was just, it was, I was bumming out there. So that was a crazy experience. Like, I mean, I, and I know some people have it differently because you know, you might, like I said, you might be in a good city. You might have a situation better, but for most times when you're coming out, it's a grind. You're going to have to go to a smaller city with a team with no money because you're a rookie. They want you to prove yourself overseas. Overseas, you got to prove yourself. So wherever in the league, they see that potential, kind of give you that money early, where <laughs> overseas, you got to work for that money to get that money. So it's, I feel like it's flip-flop with that. So that's the big difference. And I feel like the big crazy thing that happened to me overseas is realizing 
how to adjust and where, like, you know, saying, figuring out how to, the best way for me to adjust. So it's almost like a real time farm system where you start smaller and you prove yourself and they, you know, you rise through the ranks to the team with more yeah. money. More. Some guys, some guys are you know what I'm saying, depending on the agent. Some guys are blessed to come out and go to like a real good team, you know, fresh out. Like, but that's not rare, you know what I'm saying? Like, some guys, most of the time, you got to go to a team, like I said, like low budget. You might be last place in the team. And most of the time, a lot of the rookies will come out and try to, like, and it happens every year, you know, rookies will come out, hey, I'm on this bullshit crap team. Hey, I'm about to kill and kill, go get some money. And it happens. It's been happening every year. Like, so, it's just a matter of, you know, figuring out who can get more, the you know, the most comfortable. Obviously, I feel like that's the biggest thing, finding your niche, you know what I'm saying? Finding your go-to, your what you're known for as a professional. Because always, because in, in college, I feel like you kind of have, you know, a lot of guys, you can just, you're just talented. You know, the coach finds your ways to fit you in. When you're overseas, the coach was bringing you in for like two or three things. If you can't do them, do them to two or three things, you can cut you. Oh, and it's wow. quick. They'll go get somebody else quick. My first wow. year, we had like seven changes within like the first three months. So <laughs> it was just guys coming in and out. Wow. So, yeah. So uh, what did you find out? Uh, you know, how long did it take you to find out what your, you know, three, four things were? Um, as as uh, I want to say it probably took me my, hmm, to my third year. The beginning of my, no. Halfway through my third year, halfway through my third year, realizing that, you know, I I'm, I, I do a little bit of everything. You know, me me on the, me being on the court, I can't just be out there. I gotta like just be. I just gotta be moving. I'm best when I'm active. You know what I'm saying? So that's when I had to find out. Like when I'm my first year, like I was like I said, the rookie year. I was the rookie killed that year. Second year, they turned me into a stretch four. I ain't shot the three since like maybe senior year of high school. So like I had to like my, get myself, you know what I'm saying, used to shooting. Cause they were telling me if you can't, if you're not shooting this shot, you're not getting on the court. And I was not trying to go home. I was this was the year I was getting married. So I had to get the you know, I had to get the money. I was like, hey, I can't can't do that. So and then that next year kind of came into where I was kind of able to do everything. I was playing more like a four. I was just, you know, into my position. So that third year was when I was able to like, okay, I know where to pick my spots. I know when I can do what I want. Like I know, I know everything. So, and that's when I kind of took off. Ever since then, my career has just been taking a, a step up. So, I feel like my, it took me about three years to get comfortable. So, you hear a lot about how you know European basketball is different from American basketball as far as you know the way they play, the way they share the ball, just kind of everything down to X's and O's and everything else. What what do you, what's to you is the biggest difference between the two? And uh, do you feel like you enjoy European ball better, or would you say American? Mm, I'm glad you asked me this. This is I've been wanting to talk about this. This is a good question. So I feel like the difference between back home basketball or league basketball in here is the fact that like it's still team oriented. You know what I'm saying? Like these coaches will literally like I feel like in the NBA they were like, okay, we gonna. This guy's going to go one-on-one. We're going to let him go on one-on-one instead of, like, you know, really sending help. Where over here, it's like we shrinking the floor. Like, hey, we know a dude can't do this. We li- we making him go there. Like, we're going to make him beat us with his weakness or find somebody else to beat it. We're not going to, like, let him do it, you know. It's way more critiqued on shutting down that main player, whether I feel like in the league it's more we're going to try to contain him and see where the game goes after that, you know, see where our offense takes us after that. And I honestly, like, if I had a chance, I'm choosing NBA any day. Like, this answer doesn't count to anything towards that. (laughs) But I definitely feel like playing basketball overseas is way more fun because it's it's, everybody's touching the ball. Like, I'm a four-man, but I can bring the ball up when I want, you know what I'm saying, like, in our system. You know what I'm saying? Like, I I can bring the ball up if I see something. I don't, I mean, that's the same over there, but it's just like, I'm not really a, I, I can still, I'm like a point four. I can see everything still too. So it's like our co- our team kind of flourishes on the fact that everybody on the court can make decisions with the ball in their hands. So I love that fact. Like the fact that it's not too many. So you can, you, you don't have to be a selfish player to really to be too good overseas. You know what I'm saying? They see that, okay, this guy can play basketball. He might not be able to score as well as this next guy, but 
You know, he knows the game. His IQ is there, and he knows how to make that next play, you know how to defend. So I feel like you have to use a lot more IQ over here rather than an NBA. So, you know, as a four, you're not relegated to just setting picks and screens and, you know, catching lobs off roll. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think you over here, it's like you kind of open with more. And that's, I'm, that's all I'm saying. Like, the NBA is kind of getting to that point, too. I feel like the NBA is definitely – but it's more of like it's that if that pick and pop – after that pick and pop, it's either you shooting or passing it back to the guard and he going one on one. Whereas over here, if I don't have none of that pick and pop, I can continue to that left side, dribble to a guard and just let do like a nice handoff pick and roll on another. Like it's some more actions to it. It's just continuation till you find a hole in the defense. It's the, whereas I feel like the league depends more on one on one, you know? So. So it sounds like there's, you know, like you said, the difference like in the, in the league, there's a plan A, maybe a plan B, but over mm -hmm. in, over where you guys are, there's a plan A, B, okay, well, let's go to C. Let's go yeah, B, exactly. Let's try, exactly. let's try E. Well, let's go back to A. Let's go, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's constantly more, a plan. It's exactly. yeah. You're just reading it. It's all reads. It's really like you're just reading the, what the defense gives you. Yeah, I, I can imagine that being a lot more fun to play. Because um, like you said, everybody's in it. Mm -hmm. You can make decisions. You know, even part of it. Even the five man, for instance, I, like over here in in the league, I'm not playing no five man, six eight, not touching the five. Over here, I can play the five because you need guys like I said that can do a little bit of everything. You need them still rebound and still pass that ball, make you know what I'm saying, make different plays. So I like that aspect, like as in. I can find more ways to be on the court, but the more versatile I am, the more ways I can stay on the court, you know? And that's, I feel like that's one thing that helps me is the first, the fact that I'm versatile and can do a lot of different things. So, you know, we're accustomed to like in the off season, a player goes and work on, you know, whatever, whether it be their shooting or, you know, going left, shooting over deep, whatever that, you know, one or two things is. But for you, do you find yourself kind of having this duality to where you're working on a facet of your game to help you overseas, but also keep kind of keeping an eye for what might get you to the league for you know for the NBA. Do you find yourself juggling that? Definitely, definitely. Cause uh I feel like the thing that you battle overseas is like guys kind of find a way to get the job done without being as athletic. You know, where in the NBA you kind of need like they it's like, hey, I gotta keep this athleticism to be in this league. You know what I'm saying? I need it. Whereas over here, you can be a little older, you know what I'm saying, use your body to get it. You know, you just know you can find ways to get it done. So my thing is trying to keep that athleticism and still learning that nitty gritty, I guess you would call whatever we'll call over here at these overseas pros. Like if you I feel like if you would watch an overseas point guard that's been played for maybe about five, six years overseas, it's the physicality they play with is different than like anywhere I've seen, you know, and it's just, it's, I just see it because it's been from playing over here. So that's the two things. Just trying to learn how to play with that physicality, but still keeping my athleticism that would help me back when I, if I, if I ever got a chance to go back home. So do you, is there like an open, open funnel of communication to where you're receiving feedback as to what you need to improve to get to the league? Like, are they saying, Hey, you know, if you work on this, uh, we'll give you a shot. Or if you do this, you know, things like that. Do you have uh, kind of not really. That kind of go out the window maybe, you know, first, second year out of the, out the draft team. I mean, it, it depends on who you are. You know what I'm saying? You might have. But I, I think I've had, you know, some interest, but I don't really have anybody sending me feedback. You know, my agent is kind of the guy that lets me know, hey, this guy's, this team's looking at you. Keep killing. You know, this time, this team has the eye on you. Keep doing that, whatever, whatever. But, uh, Nobody really gives me feedback. I kind of, I'm kind of my biggest critic, and you know the guys I work out with, you know, uh, the basketball family. They, they been, they, they break down my film, send it to me, try to help me out sometimes. So, uh, I think that that's what it is. You got overseas. You kind of, when you go overseas, you kind of have to do a lot of work yourself with that stuff, like you know, breaking down, you know, or finding somebody that can help you out with that, rather than, you know, your team in the league will be there. Somebody with their there will help you with that. So, you know, when you look at your career, you know, you've only been out of the, out of college for five years, but you've already had a lot of success. You know, you got, you went in some championships, you won a defensive player uh, award, you know, you're putting up not, you know, good numbers. You know, would you be happy if you just never went to the NBA and just continued to do well and, and 
you know, win over there? Or is that one of those things where, man, you know, if I just got one shot? Uh, yeah, always. I'm always wishing for that one shot, always. And I think that I don't care what any black that plays overseas tells you that that's something that, that that never goes away. You know, never, never goes away. So I always think I always have that that feeling in the back of my head. But at the same time, like I said before, you know, my family we didn't have a lot. So you know, me, just being able to just you know play basketball and make money off of it, and you know have what I have now and being able to help my family like I've been able to. So it's just a blessing in itself. So I can't really like, I try my, I try my hardest not to like, you know, hang my head over that too much. A lot of people back home, like you said before, a lot of people don't know the process. And if you didn't make the NBA, you suck. And it's like, nah, nah, hold on. There's a lot of good players overseas. It's just a different, you know, so there's only so many people, only rosters, you know, only so, so many slots that can fit in. So that's kind of how I look in and you look at it, you know, I just try to get in these next slots where this, the next money is at, and it ain't big as that NBA money, but hey, it's it's up there, no taxes too. So, <laughs> so you know that's a good segue. Uh, you know, I was curious. Uh, you don't have to, you know, share your direct, um, mm-hmm. you know, line or whatever. But you know, can you give us like kind of a range or an idea of what you know you can make as an overseas player, and you know, what kind there's, of you could get? Or? There's some guys. So your league is literally like maybe. If somebody doesn't know that, that's like the next thing under the NBA. You know, like top a lot of ex NBA players come out of the league and end up playing in the uh, in the Euro League. So you could be in the Euro League anywhere. Like I know some of the top players in the Euro League is making a mil, like one point two million a year, no taxes. Nice. Uh, and then that can twinkle down to maybe I think maybe I, I don't I'm not sure. Like I don't know hundred percent, but I know like it can probably twinkle down to maybe like another a person on another team could be making maybe three hundred thousand in the Euro League, but then it twinkles down to that because these Euro leagues is the top league, the top teams in in you know what I'm saying Europe, like whatever country, and then all these teams have other teams in their countries that play in their other league, like Champions League. That's what I play in with Jerusalem. You know, we play against other teams in Europe, and most of the time it's like Euro League, Champions League, and it's like another league, Euro Cup. They're like right there. And then there's so from there you could be making anywhere from you know I could I don't really know I think maybe I could say the cap maybe is like four fifty the max and the cheapest you probably make in, in champion like at that second level maybe uh, one ten one twenty somewhere maybe a little lower than that and then after that it's like most of the time if your team's not playing like two games a week where you got to travel and play in Europe. And you only playing in your country, you could it, it could be different in different countries. Like I know Spain is a country that pays good because like they're one of the top countries, like regardless of being able to play in a European league, like they have teams that's real good in their country. But you know, that can range from like the most somebody could be making maybe it's like 130, you know, that's not playing, and then to like maybe I think my first year out, I signed for 55. So you know, it can it can range. You know, like I, like I said, it kind of goes with your success too. You kill on the team for sure. That next year, that next team gonna give you more money. So it just depends on how well you do. Well, it definitely makes a difference too if it's tax free. Um, mm-hmm. So you get to keep the bulk of it. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Because uh, yeah. I that's, that's how I look at it because you know most seasons ten months. So most seasons over here are ten months. So. Whatever I'm hearing somebody like whatever somebody's getting paid, like that guy that was getting paid one point two million, I'm like, man, that's hundred and twenty a month. Like but like <laughs> goodness gracious, like I mean, that's that's unheard of. You know what I'm saying? Like no taxes. That's unheard of. So that is nice. So that's how at, that's how I look at all these contracts. So just to just to kind of motivate myself. Damn, like that that a month, like, hmm, what should what I would do with that? You know what I'm saying? Like, what would I do with that? <laughs> <laughs> didn't even know where to start. So, and then uh, don't they don't the team cover your you know your residence over there too? So yeah, it's like they cover residence. They cover some teams cover your phone. Like I have a phone, an Israeli phone number through my team. They help me out with that. Uh, they cover your car, and then sometimes they'll add you know like flights in your contract. So like uh, for instance, they'll give you say a team gives you five con- uh, flights you account for that like your flight to the team accounts as one of those flights and then you have four to whoever you want so you can have them come over there you know so you can do whatever you want with those flights so that's another accommodation 
they'll do uh, bonuses, you know, for wins if you win the tournaments, things like that. I wish they did the MVP thing like the states, but uh, like the league does. But now most teams don't really give you all that because they don't want people shooting for the uh, individual <laughs> <over here. laughs> that because that one. I've seen some crazy things where guys really only care about themselves and they'll do anything for that. You know what I'm saying? They'll get themselves out there. So, <laughs> but yeah, like it's, just, it's, it's a lot of different, each contract's different too. Like you said, each team, but, but most of the times like those hold the apartment, a car, washer and dryer, if you're lucky, because most, some countries don't even use them. And yeah, most of the time that's really what they, they all they provide you with. So I can imagine kind of from a culture standpoint, uh, you know, when you're off the court to be in a country like, you know, Israel, it might be tough for a lot of people, but you're coming from a, you know, military, clean background. Do you think that helped you or do you have a kind of personality where you fit in, in culturally better than others might? Uh, a little bit of both. I helped like the the being in Colleen, you know, military is, I think as a matter of fact, Colleen, Fort Hood is like the biggest military, the biggest U.S. military base there is. So like it's diverse to meet all different type of people. And like I said, with my family, they were my dad, my dad and my mom's family were both in the military too. So when I'm going and seeing them, they're in a diverse city. So I'm like I've met you know all different type of people my whole life. So I definitely feel like that's helped me out. You know, being able to kind of converse with people, understand how they live. But then I am also, I can, I'm kind of laid back, you know, I just kind of observe. So with that, I can kind of fit into any situation. So I kind of, out here is different. They speak, they speak really well, uh, really good English. You know, a lot of Jews, a lot of Jewish people are connected to the state. So you might come across somebody and get lucky and hear them speak clear as day English. It's the best film in the world. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you might be lucky on that. Because, uh, you know, uh, Tel Aviv, that's a big city. That's where you, most of the time you're going to meet everybody that speaks English. But Jerusalem with a lot of the religious people is kind of tough. But for me, I just, I'm really out of there. You know, I try to stay out the way. Of course, you know, people are going to come up and ask for pictures. But, I, you know, I try to hide as much as possible. I only save that for the games because, I mean, out here, I don't think they realize that it's like, hey, I'm, I'm here in your country, like at work. You know what I'm saying? Like if I'm at the grocery store, I don't necessarily want to talk about basketball because that's all I'm here for. You know, like I don't have that escape to my family as you do. Like, so my mindset is constantly on work where you going to the game, living your everyday life, get to go see your grandma, get to, you know what I'm saying? You just get to do everything. You see me, oh, basketball. I'm like, nah, I don't want to talk about that right now. I'm just living my everyday self. It's, it's it's definitely it's definitely helps me out just that whole military aspect, being respectful to people, you know, just knowing how to do handle different situations and stuff like that. So you touched on something that I was curious about. What's the level of I guess quote unquote celebrity, you know, that you you know mm-hmm. face over there, or you know, being in your situation? Like- the, well, the, the, uh, I wouldn't say. I'm pretty known because I've been here a while and like I've climbed, like I've kind of climbed the ladder in Israel. Like my first year, I wasn't really too known. Second year made a leap, third year made a leap. And then this year I'm making an even bigger leap. So it's like, you know, like it's just, I'm climbing that ladder to people knowing my name. Just got been here a while. So for me, I would feel that like, you know, my stardom here is a little bit different than others just because I'm, I'm known where a lot of guys don't really stay in Israel too long because it's kind of like a, a bouncer place like you come here to keep to kill to get somewhere else you know unless you're on one of the two top team and that's uh how boy jerusalem and maccabi tel aviv a lot of guys stay there but uh it's it, it gets crazy over here it, it kind of gets crazy like they'll, I've, i don't think in the states i don't think in the states like and i'm not trying to compare us but like i don't think a person will approach an nba player to ask them to like Hey, I'm sending this video to my son. Could you say hey to him? Saying like it's more of a could you just take this picture with me? They like <laughs> detail. Could you give a birthday shout out? To <laughs> and could you do this? Could you do that? Hey, let's go. Could you meet me here? On, let's come to my house on Shabbat dinner. Like then, but like it's it's wild. Like it's way more. I feel like it's way more personable. But you still get that celebrity kind of you know that 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 yeah. that, that item kind of at the same time. But it's a lot more personable. Like. They, Cause it's a lot. The country is a lot more smaller too. Yeah. So it's that's a big that's a it's crazy. It's kind of fun though. Like my wife loves it. 
whenever she comes over, she always records every time somebody comes up to me and asks for pictures. It's just funny to her because, you know, back when I'm at home, I'm just another tall guy. You know, nobody really ever notices me like that. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's always uh, it's it's funny to watch celebrity kind of uh, on the outside looking in. I mean, I've watched it my whole uh, career as a journalist, so it, it's it's always kind of interesting uh, uh, to kind of see it in action. <laughs> yeah, I like I like going, I love it when I go home. Now, just being able to like really go somewhere, and the most somebody will say to me is like, "Wow, you're tall." Like, I'm like, ooh, all right, thank you. Yeah, keep on because <laughs> I know that's all they want. You know, like they don't want much. They just, oh, you're tall. I noticed you're tall. I'm gonna keep on going. Yeah, exactly. So, I love that. <laughs> when I go home, I enjoy the time I'm home. I might talk to somebody just because, just because I'm like, you can speak English, and you don't really care about me, who I, who I am, really. We just have a normal conversation. Yeah, you're just Mr. Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know. You've been uh, at the, at this for a few years now. You know what have you learned about your game and about yourself as a player? You know, on this short time, because uh, you've you've had a lot of success in a short time. I've learned that uh, a lot of a lot of the game is mental. A lot of the game is mental. It's really, I, I, I don't know. It's it's the hardest thing to explain. But I mean, I want. I feel like once you get it, you understand exactly what I'm saying. Because it's like. I've I've been to games. I've come to a game one time, literally not focused, and you know, and it shows. I done came to a game like knowing, telling myself, "This is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna kill. I'm gonna score." You know what I'm saying? Like just focused, and it showed. And it's 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 different. Like so, just being able to. It's not easy to you know. It's it's not easy to get there though. You know, it's not easy to find that way to get your mind going for the game every time. So. That's the thing that I'm still working on. But, you know, I, that's one thing I have learned that a lot of it is mental for me and just making sure that I'm active, like I said before, because if I'm if I'm not active, you might not even see me out there on the court. So um, I I'll, I'll kind of uh, end with this one. We started with a with a memorable, rebellious moment. But what's been your most proud professional moment as a player, you know, uh, whether it be team you know, something with the team, some individual. Like, what's been your favorite uh, moments so far? My favorite moment so far professionally has have to be winning the cup, the Israeli Cup, three years in a row. Nice. And, and that's and it's different because you know, like, uh, I've so I have an Israeli teammate and I have an Israeli coach that we have been like I like my first year in Israel. I was on another team in Israel. I mean, another team in Israel. I played there. Them two both were on my team. We all three left to Jerusalem and have been in Jerusalem the past three years. So every year I've been with these guys, we'd won the cup. So like that, like the fact that I have that memory, like even if we don't win it this year, and uh, you know, I'm knocking on wood because I want to win it again. But like, even if I didn't, just to say, I like, man, I won three cups in a row with these two guys that are from a different country. You know, like we did that, you know, what I'm saying? that's something that's going to go on in history books. So I feel like that's one big thing that's to me, because that's really something that's like really the first time I want some like something big, something that I could hold a trophy up, picture, people taking pictures. I'm yelling, screaming and stuff, celebrating. That was like my first like championship. So I feel and to do it three, three times back to back, you know, what I'm saying I can't I can't you know, what I'm saying that's uh, it does. I can't even explain how that feels. So I would definitely say that's the biggest thing, the, the biggest accomplishment so far. Do you feel like it was, it lived up to, cause, you know, obviously you're playing there, so you know about it. You know about mm -hmm. the championship and the previous winners or whatever else. So when you got it, did it live up to what you thought or was it better? Like, what, what was it? Mm. Yeah, but no. Yeah, because like, dang, I really won. You know, like I really handled what I needed to handle to win, like in a tournament style, like, you know, a short amount of time, not really being able to, you know, get ready, like, it really happened. I ain't never done that before, except for AAU. But uh, <laughs> so I'm like, man, that's crazy. But at the same time, the tournament that we win is in the middle of the season. So <laughs> like, it's like in like, I think normally without COVID, it probably happens like around now, finishes in like February. But like, so, but then you have the rest of the season to finish out. So 
it's kind of like short lived in the way. You know, it's like you might be, yeah, we won the cup, but hey, we got to play this team we just beat in the championship two weeks from now. <laughs> so, like, it's like they can get their revenge or you can make your stamp. So, it's like, you know, it's just different. It's not really the cup that we won, isn't it wasn't really too crazy because I mean, I still have more basketball to play. So, it was different. Yeah, I, I think the NBA was was thinking about some kind of similar format to have like a mid season. I don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, yeah, I heard something because of the, the when they were talking about how the All Star game is starting to get like like not too serious, too much no defense and things like that. I think I heard something about that too. Yeah, that would just, that just seems so foreign. But like you're actually yeah. doing it, so it's weird. <laughs> they have three, they have a whole three tournaments that matter too. Like they have a preseason one. Like the teams are pushing you to win that, <laughs> the mid one, and then the final one. And then you might be playing, like I told you before, you might be playing in the European League, and that's a whole league. So, like, you might can win that one too. So, you can, like, have a chance, like, for instance, we have a chance to win four titles every year. Nice. Oh, so, you know what I'm saying? Like, that coming into that, with the, you get the bonuses for each one you win. So, that's something that, like, a lot of these guys come over here and be looking forward to. You get walk away with some pl- more money. You know, that's always a plus. More money, more money. <laughs> you got to do it. Uh, oh. So, uh, you know, so before I let you go, like, who are your, you know, your teams as far as the NBA? And, you know, what do you think about, um, you know, like, for instance, this bubble and what they were able to do and, and their, their fast turnaround? They're about to start up in a couple more weeks now crazy. and get right back to it. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy, cause I don't, but I don't feel bad for him. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I didn't feel bad for him in the bubble at all either. All that the crying they was doing you know, in the bubble, bro. Y'all would not like overseas is different. I, I know y'all like was in the same hotel, but like not being able to talk to your family see, it's different. So I didn't really feel bad for them at all. But I do feel I do understand it is a tough turnaround, like because it's it's them going out of like their routine. You know they used to having that long like preseason and being able to do whatever they want. Uh, but I definitely don't feel bad for them. But the teams I, the teams I like this past year, my teams change every year. Ever since I got like the chance to almost go pro, a pro I like never really like liked one team anymore. I like kind of change every year. I kind of pick them at the beginning of the season and rock with them throughout. Okay. Uh, so my team on the East was the Celtics. Cause I love Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum is one of my favorite players to watch right now. Like this, I just like how smooth he just got one of the smoothest games out there. Uh, and my team on the West, I would say would have to be the Lakers. Just, but it was mainly cause I knew they was gonna win. I kind of chose them to win from the jump. So I wasn't like trying to be cheering for nobody else when I knew they was gonna win. So this, that was the two teams I was kind of going for this year. That's crazy too, because I was one of the people who thought you know, Clippers had it in the bag, um, and I like their story better. But mm-hmm. then mid season, you know, Kobe passed, uh, so I was just really conflicted with that. I'm like, man, I, I kind of want them to win it for Kobe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, it, it was a really good story the way they pulled it out, and you know, uh, like Anthony Davis hit that game winner and said Kobe. You know, it was just a lot of yeah, cool storyline with it. I feel like everybody that loved basketball. Whether you hated or love Kobe, that it, it definitely affected you. So I, I get what you're saying. Like, you know, just look, hearing little things, even for you, like, you know what I'm saying? You doing stuff that might have a connect to Kobe for you has just been like a little bit more special just because you know he's not here anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a few stories with, uh, with Kobe. He was always, um, he lived up to his kind of reputation as being kind of an a hole. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, if he knows you, it's, he's different. So I was hanging out. You ever heard of uh, Scoop Jackson? He's an yeah. original uh, Slam Magazine writer. So I was hanging out with Scoop, and Kobe came came through. He saw Scoop. He had this whole entourage. He was moving quick. He stopped and talked to Scoop for like thirty minutes, and it was just like oh, a whole wow. you know because big you know Scoop pretty much introduced him and uh, wrote all about him throughout his early life or whatever else. So and they both from you know, East Coast and everything else. So he talked to Scoop and it was just a whole different guy. Like, wow, okay. He's a completely different guy if he knows you or, or you know, has a relationship with you. So that kind of opened up my eyes a little bit. That's uh, real. That's real. That's I like I like that story. 
Yeah, yeah. So you know, it changed my mind about him as a as a as a person after that. Uh, yeah, so for it's sure. always kind of weird to get these little behind the scenes looks. And um, you know, one thing I always liked about LeBron is he'll stop what he's doing for a kid. He can be mm-hmm. going hundred miles an hour, and if the kid come up, he'll stop. If it means so you running a little. Like no, no, let me get the pictures, some whatever from or the All Star. It's a hundred reporting. If a kid, if he sees a kid come through, he's like, hey, 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 let that kid get his question in, and you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, I've always liked that about him too, and he, he's very consistent. If, if the mm. kid's involved, everything stops, and uh, you know he always stand that invitation or make sure that kid gets heard or, or take a picture or whatever else. So some of these guys get it, and you know I really. Uh, appreciate about that about them because you know these the kids are up to them, especially the great ones. Yeah, exactly. Got those those exactly. ones we need to and get. He's been, <laughs> those are the ones we yeah. need to get it. To so those are the ones that yeah, are getting watched. Been the most. Free, no trouble. Great family man. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering who will be that next guy to be the LeBron face um, of the league. Uh, man, he got about ten more years in him. We on. We got a while to see that. <laughs> <laughs> man, I don't know what he's drinking, but I need to get some of that. Cause man, he yeah. does not age. Right. And he's still, I don't know he, what he's doing. He got father time in a headlock or something because he's all the time. He's he's no he's match working. for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but hey man, it's been a huge pleasure having you on. Uh, you know, I appreciate you. I know it's really late, uh, early in the morning there for you, so. Nah, I ain't no problem. Time. I'm about to get on the phone with my wife now. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to all the rebels out there, thanks for rocking out with us. And you know, make sure you smash the like button and subscribe to the podcast. We drop a new episode each and every Thursday. You can cap in on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever else you like to catch your favorite podcast. So, for me and my special guest, Sean Thomas, take every day to learn, grow, and work. There is because there is no other option. And until next time, please stay rebellious. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. You too.